we have Samuel Goldfish now thrown in the same room as Adolf Zucker. And as I hope I can make clear here, it was very hard for anybody to be in the same room with Samuel Goldfish, whether he was selling gloves or whether he was making movies. This was not a man who played nicely with others. And Goldfish was kicked out of the company. They met at a hotel in Hollywood, and uh, he gave him almost a million dollars in cash. Thereafter, Goldfish hooked up with a pair of Broadway actor, writer, director, producers. They were called the Selwyn brothers, Edgar and Archibald Selwyn. And Goldfish went into business with them, and they formed a company combining a syllable from each of their names. That is, Gold from Goldfish and Win from Selwyn. So it was either that or Selfish Productions, um, which some say was more apt. Samuel Goldfish liked the elegant sound of the Goldwyn name and soon adopted it as his own. My father was always very sensitive about the Goldfish thing. If he saw a Goldfish bowl, it made him nervous. <laughs> After being bought out by Adolf Zucker and Jesse Lasky, fiercely independent Sam Goldwyn created a new production company. It was a gamble. His life from the day he left Europe was one big bet on himself. He loved to go to casinos, and he was a crapshooter. Uh, life had made him a crapshooter early, because it, anything was better than what I got. Goldman formed his company with the idea that he would have this logo. You know, like many companies would have a trademark, something strong. And they came up with the reclining lion sculpture, which was actually right across from the office of Goldwyn, which was the New York Public Library. And he looked out the window with his uh, publicity man and said, you know, I like that. That looks strong and good. Not strong enough. By 1922, Sam Goldwyn had been forced out of his own company. He was always working with an image that was not Shmuel Goldfish, but Samuel Goldwyn. He said, I have enough trouble handling Goldwyn. I can't deal with partners, too. The essence to my father's life is survival. And I, this is an instinct that was basic with him, almost like an animal. Without its founder, the Goldwyn Company became part of a package acquired by theater owner Marcus Lowe, including Metro Pictures, the Goldwyn Company, and Louis B. Mayer Productions. Adopting Goldwyn's Lion logo, MGM was born. The relationship between Samuel Goldwyn and Louis B. Mayer, forever linked in the most famous named studio in history, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, is really ironic because the two men loathed each other. Mogul feuds didn't stop MGM from challenging Adolf Zucker's Paramount as Hollywood's most powerful studio, especially after the right team was found to run the place. They were looking for somebody who was powerful and persuasive and charming, and Mayer seemed to fit the bill. And Thalberg seemed to be an ad, well, you know, okay, we'll take Thalberg too, but Mayer was the big thing they were getting. From the start, the new MGM team faced major challenges. They had inherited two pictures in trouble. Big studios like Warner Brothers, where Zanuck worked, could afford to take an occasional box office risk. Not fiercely independent Samuel Goldwyn. I never saw him as a mogul. He did not run a large plant with hundreds of people bowing and, and yesing him, lots of little busy assistants and vice presidents and all of that stuff. He was just one guy. He says, the day I put money under the door and wait for something to happen, he says, I'm out of this business. Every time Sam Goldwyn wanted to make a movie, he went to the Bank of America and took out a loan, and he would put his house up as collateral. So there was always a period of sweating it out for him until the returns actually came in. I remember when my father would come home at night and he'd say, and I was just a, a kid, I must have been about seven, and he'd say, well, we paid off the bank today. 
and I would get a little glass of beer to drink. In 1946, Sam Goldwyn wasn't known for tough and timely films, but he prided himself on good stories and quality. Goldwyn's most important director, William Wyler, used to say, and Goldwyn drove him absolutely crazy. Sam Goldwyn wants every movie to say, produced by Samuel Goldwyn, directed by Samuel Goldwyn, written by Samuel Goldwyn, starring Sam Goldwyn. That being said, I think perhaps one of the best qualities about Goldwyn is he would let each craftsman, each artist, do his or her job. He would throttle them. <laughs> He would shake them. Lillian Hellman, who wrote a lot of screenplays for him, said that he was a little like a man in front of a slot machine shaking it for more nickels to come out. <laughs> Sam Goldwyn liked money, but more than anything, what he wanted from Hollywood was respect. That meant a Best Picture Academy Award. After 20 years of disappointment, the honor came in 1946 with a moving film that summed up an America recovering from four years of the loss and dislocation of war and now facing the promise and uncertainties of a fresh start. The Best Years of Our Lives was the most important film in Samuel Goldwyn's career, professionally and personally. And it turned out to be one of the most significant films I think ever made. Magnificent movie. And I came into it, as I think probably any veteran would, uh, a little suspicious. We'd been through an earth shattering, life changing experience of our own, and we weren't about to uh, accept any bullshit version of, of what that, that uh, experience had been like. Well, it not only didn't have any bullshit, it, was, it just portrayed what we thought, what we felt, right down to the core of our being. For irascible, independent Sam Goldwyn, the Academy Awards for 1946 were as life-changing as the film had been to many World War II veterans. He always felt that the Academy Awards were run by the big studios. He always uh, felt he would never get one. And he went home that night and he looked at the award and he sat and cried. It meant, it meant a great deal. He never wanted to admit that he wanted one because he didn't think he'd get it. Post war. There was a lot of studio politics all around Hollywood, but a lot of that took place at dining room tables around town. And the Goldwyn dinner party was considered the hardest ticket in town. They gave small dinner parties, sometimes a couple of nights a week. And as Catherine Hepburn said, you always knew where your career stood by where you sat at the Goldwyn dining room table. And there were the regular Goldwyn croquet games. If you were extended that invitation, you really knew you had arrived. The bad news is you then had to play croquet with Sam Goldwyn. <laughs> Periodically, uh, I'd, I'd be stupid enough to go up there and watch him. And he'd say to me, now tell him, tell him, tell him I'm not cheating. And he was cheating. And I said, I better stay out. I'd look at these guys. And I said, don't get me into this. Whether it was croquet, poker, polo, or movie making, the aging moguls remained convinced that they were masters of the game. But the rules were changing. By the end of the 60s, independent Sam Goldwyn hadn't produced a picture in years, but he relished his role as an elder statesman. In 1962, he presented an award to a promising young writer named Francis Ford Coppola. Goldwyn had come a long way since 1895 when he left Poland as young and penniless Schmuel Gelbfisch and set out to find his fortune in the United States. In his late 70s, with his health failing, the old mogul remained as irascible as ever. My father, when he was very, very old and very weak, he had a nurse. 
and uh, he liked to go down and sit at his, t his dinner table, and he was trying to pick up a spoon, and he started to shake, his hands started to shake, and the nurse reached over and tried to help him, and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to help you to eat. He said, help me? How the hell do you think I got out of Poland? That, that to me, epitomizes my father. 94-year-old Sam Goldwyn died in 1974. His pride and fierce determination were the essence of Hollywood's founding moguls.